Praise God. It's good to be back with you this morning. Thank you, Pastor, for letting me uh, speak. I've got a lot of different things uh, along the subject we've been talking about to, to minister on, and uh, uh, maybe we'll, we won't definitely get to it today, but we'll see. But um, uh, about the hand, so uh, youth ministry is dangerous, let me just say that. Uh, Friday night we had a youth event, and uh, I was riding, I decided to ride my bike this time instead of a skateboard. I skateboard, and so I decided I'll ride my bike instead because it's faster. I can keep it with people better. Well, I've got a mountain bike, and so I ride a lot at uh, San Falasco and, you know, rock and dirt and gravel and stuff. Well, I was going down the parking garage as soon as we got there, and apparently I must have hit a slick spot or something, and big knobby tires that are meant for dirt aren't really good on concrete. And uh, so it slid out from underneath me, and uh, I hit the ground pretty hard, and and uh, I'm all different colors on this side, and uh, so there was, it was a challenge getting dressed this morning, and uh, I, and this is broken. I don't know if I've, if you if you could say that it's broken in three places or broken in three pieces, but the my thumb is busted into three pieces. The the bone on the end. I landed. I protect my head. I landed like this, and and I just shattered it. So anyway, everything's in place. It's right where it needs to be. And, uh, but I can't do anything with this hand for a little while. I thought I would take this off this morning because this big old thing is kind of distracting. Then I realized my hand is doing a Barney impersonation, and that might be really, if you know who Barney is, the purple dinosaur that kids are watching, right? My hand looks like a Barney dinosaur hand, so it's swollen and, and, and all kinds of lovely colors. So this is probably less distracting. So anyway, we're going to have a good time this morning. Are you with me? So you can look to the person next to you and say, this guy need, needs help this morning. <laughs> So this guy needs our help this morning, so um, trust that you're uh, believing God with me. We're going to have a good time. I'm really excited about the subject uh, that I started last week, and if you weren't here, we'll talk about it here in just a second, but man, I'm really excited about it. I believe it was something that uh, uh, the Lord specifically directed me to talk about last week, and, and I believe He wants us to continue to talk about it, and even broken fingers, we're still going to do it. It's yeah. important. And um, so the topic, the title of the message uh, today we're continuing is Money Matters, and um, I know people, a lot of times, uh, we said this last week, and a lot of times when you hear the word money in church, people get upset. Oh, you shouldn't be talking about money in church. Well, that's actually just unscriptural. Uh, the Bible's got a lot to say about the subject of money. God had a lot to say. Jesus had a lot to say about the subject of money. More than a third of all of uh, Jesus' uh, par- uh, parables were concerning things or monetary issues and using them as illustrations and warnings and promises. And so obviously the Bible has a lot to say about it. And, uh, you know, people say, well, the lo- you know, money is the root of all evil. No, that's a misquote. John, 1 Timothy 6.10 says the love of money is the root of all evil. And we, I believe that that was inspired by the Spirit of God. Paul didn't just write that because he had a thing against money and offerings. He, he believed that, that, that by the Spirit of God that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's very, very dangerous. And um, so, you know, when people, people are, 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 are careful or don't want to hear these things, they're really missing out. God's got a lot to say about it. And so we want to do, we want to do this justice. We want to talk about what the Bible says. And, and you can relax. We're not taking up another, another offering. We've already taken up the offering today. And what you gave is what you gave, and, and that's fine. Um, and we'll have another one tonight if you feel like you need to do more afterward, but that's not why we're doing this. And if you believe that money is evil, then we'll put a bucket up here after service and we'll let you unload all you have. That'll be fine. Uh, everybody knows money is not evil, right? I mean, I, you've never seen a hundred dollar a bill assault anyone, right? You know, it, it, it may have bad stuff on it. You do know money's very dirty. It's got a lot of you anyway, wash your hands after you've been holding money, but, but um, it's never done anything bad to anybody. It's, it's a tool. And so uh, oftentimes people who are very upset about the subject of talking about money in church, and, and we have to acknowledge, like I did last week, there's been a lot of abuses in the area of finances by ministries and ministers. I said last week, you know, there's a lot of ministers and ministries, unfortunately, uh, one of their biggest gifts, and it's not a gift from God, but one of their biggest gifts is prophesying and preaching money out of people's pockets into their own, and that's not right. Right, But just because people abuse it, and I've seen it, I've been around it, I've heard it, you've heard it, we've all heard the stories, we've all seen the examples. And you know, when this happens, it does a great disservice to the kingdom of God. It really does. And so as ministers, we ought to live above that. We ought to be very careful, very uh, uh, diligent where money is concerned, very careful how we handle these things. But as believers, we all need to be very careful about this. You know, as a believer, if you handle money incorrectly, it's also a bad witness to the kingdom of God as well. So we need insight on all of these things, and, and not handling it right is more than just manipulation. Not handling it right includes not doing things the way God says to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Anytime you get outside of God's word or his instruction on any subject, you get outside of God's blessing, you get outside of God's grace, you get outside of what God originally intended. And of course, if it's something illegal or wrong, you suffer the consequences for that. But if you get outside of the teaching of God's word, you also suffer by missing out on the blessing, the provision, the, the, the benefit of whatever the subject is, you get outside of God's blessing there as well. And it causes you to miss out and it causes our testimony, our witness, and our influence in the earth uh, is, is, is very much diminished. We read the scripture in 3 John. We'll let you turn to it. 3 John, the first chapter. And uh, verse number two, 3 John, verse number two, just one chapter here. Like I said, felt very strongly about this uh, topic. And I know I told a joke last week. Should I tell another one just before we get started? Do you think so? Was, was last week's okay? Now, it was a lawyer joke last week. And so I'll have to be careful because Jonathan Green, he's taking a year off of school, right? Taking a gap year. Is that right, Jay? He's going to take a year off. Then he's going to go to law school. So I guess once that happens, we can't tell lawyer jokes anymore. So up until then, we're going to hear lots of lawyer jokes, but not today. But I, I had several. I thought there's some good dad jokes out there. You like dad jokes? Who likes dad jokes? Who thinks dad jokes are really corny? How do dinosaurs pay their bills? They write Tyrannosaurus checks. <laughs> That's pretty bad. That's pretty bad. Uh, uh, let's see. There were several that are that are <laughs> that was was awful. What did the vault company put or the safe company put on their billboard ad? If someone steals your money, it's not our vault. Now, I heard this one, and this is not a dad joke, but it is a kind of a dad joke, and this is not my dad, but I think everybody in the room can relate to dads in general, and the joke goes, it says, my dad's so cheap that when he dies, it's not my dad, because he's still here, thank God, it, is, it, it might be my mom, but I think it fits, but anyway, uh, my dad's so cheap that when he dies, he's going to walk towards the bright light and turn it off. <laughs> I got to admit, I am the guy at our house. I am on light duty all the time. Not because of the light bill. It just annoys me that there's only five of us in this house, and we've got enough light on to light all of High Springs. What are we doing? So, so my dad's so cheap when he dies, he's going to go to the bright light and turn it off. So anyway, now we're all relaxed. Third John, verse number two, it says, Beloved, and he's writing to believers, Beloved, you can say it this way, he's writing to you. Anytime you read the word, you want to read it in light of how does this apply to me? And this ought to encourage you, this ought to, to bless you, this ought to really stir us up. I'm here to tell you, there's a whole lot more for us to see in this and for us to experience in this. And that's not getting an error, that's not, that, that, that is, there's a lot more to see of what God wants to do in our life that is kingdom necessary, kingdom related, and it will do it, we'll get to enjoy the benefits along the way, but we'll be able to do what God's called us to do. But it said here, beloved, I pray, this is John writing, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. He said, brethren, I pray that you prosper in all things. He's talking about business dealings. When you look at it, he's talking about prospering, not just prospering and being happy, which is good, but specifically, he wants you to prosper in the area of business, financial areas, and be in health just as your soul prospers to the same degree. Well, everybody knows he wants you to grow spiritually. He wants you to grow in, in your, your, your soul, your mind, will, and emotion. He wants you to renew your mind. He wants all those things to happen. Well, to the same degree, he wants you to prosper and be in health. I know this does not make the Lord happy. And I can tell you what, it's going to heal extremely fast, right? Because I have a covenant. I'm not, I'm not relying upon natural health. God is working in this, and I'm going to do my part, not going to bump it, not going to knock it around. But at the same point, he's working. Why? Because he wants me to be in health. Well, he also wants me to, be, uh, to live a prosperous life. And let me tell you, no matter where you are today in your financial realm, in the financial realm, in the business realm, no matter where you are, God wants you to prosper. And you might say, well, I'm pretty prosperous. There is not a single person here in this room or listening online, I don't know which camera is on, right? There, there's not a single person that has reached the level of what God's idea of what meaning to be prosperous in this life, what it looks like. 
None of us have, have experienced it. So whatever you're at, there's always a danger to get offended and not grow from where you are if you're struggling and maybe think God wants you poor or wants you broke. We know that's not true. That, there's a danger there. There's also a danger in experiencing the blessings of God and thinking, I've arrived. Any area where you feel like we've arrived on or someone thinks they've arrived in, you've cut short what God wants to do. He does exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask or what? Think. That means as big as we can think, he thinks bigger. As big as we think on any area, he, as, be, as good as we think, he thinks better. No matter what it is, he, he, he is above us. His ways are as high as the heavens are above the earth. So are his ways above our ways, his ways of thinking about things, how we see things. He's in a completely different realm than us, but we get the opportunity to rise up to raise, to, 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 to grow our faith, to grow our expectation, to grow our cooperation with the Lord in these things. And this includes the area of finances. He wants you, everybody say, God wants me blessed. He wants me to prosper in all things. I tell you, you begin to confess God's word and change it, I am prospering. I am prospering and I am in health just as my soul prospers. I tell you, if you're growing spiritually and you believe God, you'll grow financially you're in prosperity. You'll grow and you'll, you'll develop where the physical realm as well. Health will follow you. Thanks for your encouraging words there. Yeah, it'll follow you. The word is life to you. It's health to your flesh, but it's also health to your pocketbook. It's life to your bank accounts. Why? Because that's not being selfish. That's not being, uh, uh, you know, people think, you know, preachers ought not have anything. Christians ought to be poor. You ought to be humble as to be poor. Well, that makes no sense. David was a man after God's own heart, and he was very, 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 very prosperous. Some other time, we'll look at the offerings that David presented when, to, to get ready for the presenting of the temple, the building of the temple. His offerings were massive personal offerings, not the kingdom offerings. His own personal offerings were massive. And it was so big, it took very long periods of time to even get it together. And he was a man after God's own heart. Well, if, if the way a lot of people look at it were true, it, David should have been very, very poor. If, if being poor means you're humble or close to God, then, then it just doesn't make any sense. Jesus was wealthy. Jesus, but when he was born, he was so well supplied by the Magi and the ones that came to visit him. It funded the rest of his life. God wants you to prosper. He wants you to be blessed. Amen. And so we did, we talked about a lot of things and it's already 1125. So uh, you can go back and listen to uh, uh, the subject uh, last Sunday, last Sunday night. You know, I just mentioned last Sunday that the area of finances and, and money troubles or money matters because it's really a twofold title, issues of or, or the importance of money in our life, but also the, the issues of finances. It's a money matters and money matters, two different ways of looking at it. But the issue of finances is the number one, number or the top three leading issues of stress in America. Okay, things that people are stressed about, worried about. How many know the Bible says we're not to be anxious or to worry about anything? How you know stress and worry are related to those things, right? Stress is related to that. Well, the number, the top three things people are stressed about in our culture is money times. And we're looking around right now and people are stressed out. We need to know what the Bible says. The number one reason for wars that have gone on historically has been, number one, economic gain. So it is a driving factor. It's the third reason for pe why people get divorces in America is because of money issues. So we need to have a, a, a solid basis on this. But we looked at last week, and I just want to review these real quick. Money matters to God as well. They're important to him. Like I said, earlier, uh, two third or a third, over a third of all the uh, different uh, uh, parables that Jesus spoke of, spoke of were concerning money. But also go to uh, Luke chapter four. We looked at this and trying to be quick this morning, but uh, it's not always easy to do. In Luke, the fourth chapter, we said we read this last week, and this is after Jesus had been anointed, the Spirit of God had come upon him. And what, what an awesome, uh, and I would have loved to have been here that day and to have seen this. And he walked into the temple and he opened up the book uh, from the prophet Isaiah and he read these words. This is Luke chapter 4, the 16th verse. It says, Then he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And as he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me 
What? The number one thing is the thing that he listed. He said, he has anointed me. The Spirit of God is upon me, and he has anointed me. What? To preach the gospel to the poor. To preach the gospel to the poor. He went on to say to, to heal the broken hearty, heart, hearted, to, uh, to proclaim liberty to the captive, recovery sight to the blind, liberty to those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. But the first thing he mentioned in connection with the Spirit of God, the anointing upon his life, was to preach the gospel to the poor. What is that gospel? The gospel is you don't have to be poor anymore. That's good. That is good news. You don't have to be broke. I'm telling you what, the devil wants to fight this more than any, probably more than one, any other thing. Because if you can be financially sound, you often, many areas of your life, you'll be mentally sound. And a lot of the stress and the things that people just end up just wasting so much time on will be resolved. God wants you prosperous. The enemy wants you broke. And Jesus came so that you would have to, what, proclaim or proclaim the gospel to the poor. We looked at the, uh, the scripture in, um, in uh, let's see which one I want to look at. In, in 2 Corinthians, you can go there, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 in the ninth verse. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. I love the amplified version of this. I'll just go ahead and read it to you. The amplified says, for you are becoming progressively acquainted with and recognize more strongly and clearly the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his kindness, his gracious generosity, his undeserved favor and spiritual blessing. Notice the description here of the grace of God. It's a wonderful thing. It's his kindness, his generous mercy, his undeserved favor and spiritual blessing. Notice what that description of the grace of God was in connection with. He said, in that though he was so very rich, yet for your sakes, he became so very poor. Why? In order that by his poverty, you might be enriched or abundantly supplied. So this awesome grace of God, this awesome love of God, grace of God, all of these things that his uh, uh, kindness, gracious generosity, his undeserved favor and spiritual blessings, part of the reason he came and he, be, he came is so to take our place of lack so we could take his place of abundance. That's part of redemption. It does us and the world a great disservice to not be strong on this. I didn't say be overboard or be in error, but be strong in it. Just because people get off on one side of the ditch doesn't mean we need to get in the other side of the ditch to fix it. Let's get in the middle of the road of what God's word says. I really believe on all of this, there's breakthrough for people. There's breakthrough for, the, for people. I felt very strongly about this. There's breakthrough for people in this room. There's breakthrough for people who are listening online. There, are, there is breakthrough if we'll embrace this and just do what the word says. Quit fighting God. Let the undeserved favor and grace of God work in our life. Oh, I don't deserve it. He knows that. He gave it anyway. Right? And that's the good news of all the promises and provisions of God. We don't have to earn it. Jesus paid for it for us. Amen. And because of our Savior, what he's done, I don't want to live in a level that would do that in injustice. He came for this reason. Yes, to save you. Yes, to heal you. But also to deliver us from lack and not having enough. Amen. Amen. Galatians chapter 3. We didn't read this last week, but we'll read it now. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Now, obviously, our, our pastor is a series guy, and uh, I'm a bit of a series guy as well. We have a series going on on Wednesday nights that have been going on for months, and you might say, oh, that sounds terrible. It's been really good, but <laughs> if I say so myself, it's been good, but um, I'm not going to finish this today, so we'll see how we do this at another time. But in Galatians 3, 13, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Aren't you glad you've been redeemed from the curse of the law? That ought to excite you. Yeah. Woo, I'm redeemed. I'm not you, but I am redeemed. Praise God. Redeemed from the curse of the law. Verse 14, that the blessings of Abraham... Not the poverty of Abraham, not the not get a buy of Abraham, not the I don't know what I'm going to do of Abraham, but the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Jesus Christ that we may receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The promise of the Spirit was part of the blessing, but also resources was part of the blessing. Genesis says that Abraham, Abram was a very prosperous man. 
He was extremely prosperous. He and Lot had to separate their goods and their possessions because they had so much stuff they were competing in the same land. They had to separate. He had so much. How about that? How about this reason you have to get a new house? Is because you got too much stuff and people are too close to you. I need to spread out, not because you just want your privacy. It's just the blessings of the Lord are so great on me, I just need room to store them all. Well, pastor, now now that's sounding like greed. No, that's religion. I said, you do realize that's religion. The prosperity Abraham did established a covenant, and it set up the people and set up a lineage of, of, of faith and believing and what to expect to fund and, and to fund an entire nation and to prepare the way. Part of that was preparing the way for the master to come. We need to embrace this. Listen, I'm talking about being kingdom-minded with our finances. The first and primary thing, God wants you blessed because the kingdom of God needs us to be prosperous. He needs us to be prosperous. He needs you and I to live in a place of abundance where we're not worried about the day-to-day. We're not concerned with those things, but we have an abundance for every good work and charitable donation. That is the will of God. Amen. That's the will of God. I don't know about you, but I'm trusting the Lord is at work in my life. Amen. Praise God. We said on Sunday night, you know, I was just talking about it, gave, gave the example of... Uh, of uh, uh, Abner Yoder, who was one of the, the board members of Kenneth Hagin Ministries, and, and uh, this man was a great, a great blessing to many ministries, or Randy Greer's ministry, different ones, just a great blessing to many ministries. And even in death, he's been, he went home to be with the Lord when? How long ago was that? It's been a few years ago. He went home to be with the Lord. He had such prosperity in his life. Even today, every month, he set up an organization in his absence. Even today, him and his wife have gone home even today, every month, they're supporting the gospel all around the world. They're not even living here anymore, and they're supporting the gospel anymore. And I told the Lord, yeah, oh, that's right. He gave us the trusses for the, for the youth building. Just gave them to us. Praise God. You have to be blessed to just give things away. If you're going to keep, stay in business, you have to be blessed to do that. He just gave us those things. Well, I was just, Amy and I were talking. I said, you know, we need to believe God for, you know, for some Abner Yoders out of our church. And the Spirit of God just told me, I want to raise up Abner Yoders out of your church. Yeah. Instead of having them come in, how about having them grow up out of our own church? Yeah. Is that wrong? No, that's Bible. Yeah, yeah but my it doesn't matter about your situation. Abraham was nobody before. And God raised him. Abner Yoder came out of abject poverty. God raised him up. God blessed him. And he had a kingdom mindset the whole way through. He funded the gospel. How many lives have been changed as a result of Abner Yoder? Tons of people's lives were changed. You can do the same thing with your finances. That ought to encourage you. God wants us to be blessed. Amen. So why are so many people struggling? You can go back and listen to uh, some of the things we've talked about before, last Sunday morning, last Sunday night. So why are so many struggling? Why are so many people uh, 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 struggling in this area? Of course, if you're not born again, a person doesn't have a covenant with God. And you have to also understand, just because somebody looks like they're prosperous on the outside, if they don't know Jesus, their life is a mess, right? There's a scripture that says, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow with it. There is a blessing that comes from the world, but there is sorrow attached to it. Turn on the news every, all the time. You'll see lives and people that pursued riches and blessing, and all, but they didn't do it God's way. And I mean, let me tell you, anything that's not according to Scripture is under this category, born again or not, that's not God's way. And people pursued riches, pursued blessing, and their lives are a mess. God doesn't want our lives to be a mess. He wants us to be fulfilled and happy in these things. Well, but oftentimes believers, there's a lot, many believers who are not living up to these things and we're not being critical or judgmental, but we want to look at this and see what's going on, what's happening. Uh, There are a lot of people who are living below these things. Number one, uh, they've let other people's opinions. Let me tell you, the world and the world system should not tell us how to believe. We shouldn't bend to the influence of this age, the spirit of this age in any single area. The same spirit that would tell you you have to be quiet about your testimony, what God has done for you, is the same spirit that wants you to be broke and say that, listen, money's not right for you. It's okay for me, but not right for you. The church shouldn't have anything. That is wrong. 
And then also people are struggling because they're just not doing what the Bible says. Sometimes it's a lack of understanding. Sometimes it's just pure disobedience. Sometimes it's even just bad experiences in the past. Maybe the, the minister, the person we referenced before, just damaged them in some way. And now they're having a hard time trusting God. Let me tell you, if that's where you're at, forgive the person and trust God. So I got to forgive somebody. Yeah, sometimes you have to forgive somebody before you can move on. In the area of money, there are people who hold a lot of grudges over money. I always used to joke, you know, when, and Amy and I were in Bible school. We lived out in Tulsa. She worked for a bank. I worked for a bank. And, and, and I always joked, since it kind of was a little bit of a surprise to me. You really find out who people are when it comes to their money. You find out real quick who somebody is when it comes to I see some heads nodding. I mean, I remember that there was this one lady we had that came to our bank, and she was a very mature lady. She was, she was, she was. She was uh, advanced in years, you know, care, I know, no, I'm trying to be careful, I'm trying to be careful. And uh, she was, a, she was a, a sweet lady, she'd come in and she was always just so nice and, and just so sweet and just so pleasant and, and we just looked forward to her pulling up every day. I ran the commercial drive, you know, the commercial lane, you know, after school, after we'd get out of class and so all the other tellers were there and she'd pull up and like, oh, so-and-so's here and we'd all wave at her. I'll never forget one day, this infamous day, that someone shorted her change $20. She wanted some cash back and it was $20 short. She went from sweet lady to a WWE wrestler. I mean, she went to the next level upset, right? And she was never nice again. $20. And they gave her the $20. She was never nice again. People, people can hold on to grudges where money, well, what if somebody has wronged you financially? You have to forgive them. I hate to tell you, you'll have to forgive them. But I get to tell you, you get to forgive them. Because you forgive them, then, then you know God, you're not, you're not restricting yourself or his blessing in your life. Go over to Haggai, uh, Haggai chapter one. We've got to go quick here, Haggai chapter one. Is this all right this morning? Like I said, we're not trying to manipulate anybody. We're not trying to put pressure on anybody. We just, we just want to present what the Word says. And, and of course, as of all things, then you decide what to do with it. If it's not Bible, then you don't have to listen to it. If it is Bible, then you have to make a decision. What are, what are you going to do? Who are you going to serve? What are you going to believe? As for me and my house, we've chosen to serve the Lord. We've chosen to obey the Lord. Amen? Haggai chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, of course, you know, the, we, we do know the Lord hears us. He says, the time has not come. This is what they were saying. The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet saying, is it time for you, to, for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses in this temple to lie in ruins? Now notice they weren't saying that they weren't going to do it. They were just saying now's not the time. They said, listen, is the time now to build the temple? He said, they're saying, it's not the time now. We're, we're time, it's time to do something else. It's not saying it wasn't ever, just not right now. Verse 5 says, now therefore, says the, the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Consider your ways. I've had the Lord ask me at different times, what are you doing? That, that's, a, that's a 22nd century version of consider your ways. What, what are you, anybody ever had the Lord say, what are you doing right now? Nobody, just, just a couple people. Maybe you, you get upset and you're complaining a little bit and on the inside you get a, what are you doing right now? Right? Well, this is, he gave them a, a, a what are you doing moment. He said, consider your ways. You have sown much and you bring in little. He's talking about natural investments. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put it in a bag with holes. Sadly, this is where a lot of people are in much of the unsaved world. This is how they live. And there's enough people in the world system that are doing well. You have, you have to understand the devil's really smart. He'll let enough people do really. He doesn't want anybody to do well in any area of life. He hates everybody. But he'll let a select few do well. And those are the ones that we, can, we call celebrities. One that everyone wants to follow on Instagram and all these places. He'll let a few do really well. And, but the majority are, are struggling and having a hard time because he wants to keep the dream alive. He wants everybody to be looking for what possibly could be me. Well, they've hit it. They've made it big. Maybe one day I'll, ma I'll make it big. Most people are not doing well. Many in the church are not doing well. 
Just because you see a few that are doing well in the world doesn't mean any. Most people are not doing well. And sadly, many in the church, not here necessarily, but in the body of Christ, many people are not doing well. This describes what's going on in their life. They so much, they bring in little. They eat, but they don't have enough. They drink, and they're not filled with drink. They, they clothe themselves. Notice they clothe themselves, yet they're not warm. They earn wages, but they put it in a bag with holes, meaning that what they come in just seems to go out so fast. You've heard people say it. Money comes and goes so quickly, right? I mean, you, when prices are going up, like, boy, it sure goes quick. Who's heard that in the last few weeks? Going to the gas pump, boy, it sure goes quick. Well, I'm Pastor Angela. They were in Pastor. They were in... in uh, California, gas at times was over $6 a gallon there in California. I guarantee there are people, at the, I've had people, every time I go get gas, somebody makes a comment about the gas prices. Why? Because people are struggling. They're in a position where they're earning things, but it's not enough. It's just disappearing. Verse 7, Haggai 1, 7, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, once again, consider your ways. So go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because my house of my house that lies in ruins while every one of you runs to his own home. He was giving them, he was letting them know where their problem is. He's saying, listen, you need to watch what you're doing. What is he saying? Consider your, set, your ways. What are you doing? And then we, we go on down to the second chapter, verse 15. It says, And now carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, he's addressed them, and of course they've made some changes in their heart. He said, Since, since those days when one came uh, to a heap of 20 ephahs, but there were twin, or, or 10, when one came to a, vi- a, a, a wine vat to draw up 50 baths for the press, but there were only 20, meaning there was a time when they, their investments weren't producing the way they should. He said, I struck you with blight and mildew and hail in the labors of all your hands, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord of hosts. He said, once again, consider, your, consider now from this day forward, from the 20th day, 20th, the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day of the fountain, foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? Are yet the vines, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree, and, and the olive tree have not yet yielded fruit. He said, listen, you're just now made an adjustment in your life, and nothing in the natural has changed. But he said, but from this day forward, I will bless you. Earlier he was saying, listen, he said, consider your ways. You're preferring yourself above what you should be preferring. And I know this goes against the culture that we live in, goes against the, the spirit of this age. The spirit of this age is look out for number one, isn't it? Take care of me first, me and mine, and then I'll see what's left. He said, listen, that attitude is why you don't have enough. They made an adjustment. He said, listen, I'm just telling you right now, even though nothing has changed in the natural, even though you've not even invested anything yet, just know from this point on, because you've changed your heart, I will bless you. They got out of the place where God couldn't bless them, and they moved into a place where God could bless them. That's where you want to be. Not putting thing, first things first gets you out of what God, his intention, his ability to bless you. Making an adjustment and, and making the determination from the beginning right now today, if you're here and you're not putting first things first, making a simple adjustment, well, Pastor Greg, how's that going to work? Don't even, let's not even look at that yet. Make a purpose in, my, in your heart. I'm going to put first things first. If you mean it with God, God will start blessing you. I should have gotten more amens out of that. God will bless you. He will, he will, he'll start blessing you on credit. But he knows your heart. Oh, Lord, I'm going to put you first. <laughs> I'm going to see how this works. No, if your heart's not right, you can trick God with words. He knows your heart. We've all been in places where we made a decision, but whether it be like, for instance, going to the gym, I've had enough. How many times have you gone and said, you know what, I'm going to get healthy, but you don't really mean it. I'm going to get healthy and you go get another Oreo, right? I mean, you know, I'm going to get healthy, right? But, but there comes a day where you're like, you're like, you know what, I'm sick of this. I'm going to go get healthy. Now, you make a change in purpose, and even though you're not, you've not done it yet, you start feeling better just when you make a decision. I'm doing this. I mean, anybody else who's been there, you make the decision. I just start feeling like, all right, all right I'm, oh, yeah, I'm doing something now. I'm not just, make, just, just blowing smoke. I'm actually doing something. If you make a change in your heart, he said right here, he said, I will bless you. From this day, I will bless you. 
Go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It's 1147. We've got to go quick. 11, Matthew 6, 33. I'm telling you what, there's answers here for people. I said there are answers here for people. Matthew 6, 33, but it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I want you to hear it. We have his word on this. This was the master speaking. He'd been talking about all the things they need, what the world seeks after. He said, listen, I know you need all of those things. He said, but seek what? First. First. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He said, well, he's talking about living right. He was talking about resources, substance, material things just before this. Yes, In our walk with God, but you realize that your walk with God and your resources are tied together. Jesus also said, where your heart is, your treasure, or your treasure is, your heart will be also. You can't separate the two. We talked a little bit about that last week. We've got we can talk about that some more some other time. But he says, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. What a promise. What a promise from our master. He knows there are things, you need a place to live. You need something to drive. You need clothes to wear. And in fact, he wants you to live in something good, drive something nice, and wear things that you like. And he said, listen, if you'll put me first, all of these things will be added to you. You may say, well, I'm not living it, Pastor Greg. Well, you know, you could be that, that the enemy, you're going through a season of testing where you're, the enemy's testing you and you've got to prove yourself. Those happens, but if you're living there continually, maybe there's an adjustment that needs to be made in your life. And we're not going to have time to get into everything today, but, but, but we're going to get into some of it. I want to talk about tithing for a minute. So, oh, oh, the T word. He said the T word in church. Don't say tithing, Pastor Greg. I knew it. They're trying to get money out of my pocket into the church. No, no, we're not. I'm not trying to get anything out of anywhere. I'm trying to tell you what the Bible says. I, I looked up, I did this several years ago, uh, studies or statistics of tithing in America. I didn't look it up again because it, it probably hasn't changed. It's been five, six years ago. I've not seen this massive revival in the area of finances in the church. It's probably the same. Let, let's say it's probably 1% or 2% better. We'll give it a, a plus maybe. But one study said out of adults, 84% of people gave to a church or nonprofit at least once a year, once any given year. 84% of people. This was talking about Christians, believers. 7% tithe consistently. 24% of evangelical Christians tithe consistently. And 11% of charismatic and Pentecostal Christians tithe consistently. 11%. Now, I don't know what our numbers are here. I'm not into all that. I know we have an above average church, but we still need some light in these areas. You're trying to drum up money. No, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. One of the things we said last week is, does God need our money? And it's twofold, yes and no. Yes side of it, there's a big vision. There's a big mission to do. It's $20,000 to put on a crusade in Africa. Not to mention the fact that when we go, we, the church, Impact Family Church, part of your mission is giving. We feed the pastors who come. We, 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 we do all of this stuff so they can receive while they're there. That, that's, that's important for the work of the kingdom. It takes 20 grand to put it on, not travel costs to get there, just to do it in Botswana or Zambia, it's $20,000. You can't do that with monopoly money. It takes real money, right? Well, he needs us to fund the gospel. He, because God's not in heaven passing. He's not a counterfeiter. He's not raining down hundreds from heaven. That would get him in trouble. He's not going to do that, right? And if you see a heavenly hundred, don't use it, right? It, it doesn't exist, right? I found some, some funny money. You better get away from that funny money. You know, I don't know what that is, but don't touch it. He needs us to be blessed, but, but yes and no, he just wants our heart. If this offends you, you got a heart issue. I love you enough to tell you the truth. If this bothers you, you got a heart issue because you want to hold on to that more than you want to hold on to God's word. I'm not being critical, but that's, 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 that's what it is. The, the Lord told the children of Israel, consider your ways. Hey, you need to check yourself. What are you doing? What are you doing right now? Better check yourself. Another study said 5 to 20% in any given church tithe. Another said, a study said 25% give nothing ever. 
said 36% give less than 2% of their income, 27% actually tithe, this one study said. So 25% do nothing ever. Another study, and this was of, of those who, who said that their faith was, they said their faith was very important to them and that they attend church at least twice a month. I think that's kind of funny. My faith is very important to me. I go to church at least twice a month. Maybe they need some teaching on the fact the Bible says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together, which is the manner of some, but all that much more as you see the day approach, right? Anybody going to take a laugh on that one? All right. We, I'm telling you. It's, it's Bible. I wish the pastor would. Would you rather the pastor said just do what you want or say do what the Bible says? I'd rather the pastor tell me to, and we've had them for years, this is what the Bible says. Of people who said their faith was very important to them and they attend the church at least twice per month. This, of this people, it was a combined income of two and a half trillion dollars. The tithe of that would have equaled 46 billion to ministry in America around the world if everybody had tithed on that. Imagine what the church, what the kingdom of God could do with $46 billion annually just in the United States of America. Amongst those who say their faith is really important to them, they go to church at least twice a month. That's not even all the church. That's just those people. $46 billion, or that's a billion, yeah, $46 billion to, the, to the gospel. Tithing is an important thing. You do know tithing and tipping are not the same. One of those studies said that 36% give less than 2% of their income. If it's not 10%, it's a tip. Are you a tither or are you a tipper? Tithe means 10%. Slapping a 20 in every week, that's a tipper. <laughs> Sees that as a cheap tipper. It depends on what your income. 20, it's a mathematical equation. 10% is 10%. If $20 is your 10%, man, it is holy to the Lord. It is powerful. It is awesome. That $20, that $20 if your income is 20, I'm, I, and I'll say this before Uncle Sam take his, takes his share, right? If your income is $200 a week, that $20 is powerful. It'll change your life if you don't eat it, right? Leviticus 27, verse 30. I know it's 11.54. Man, the, I want to look at the book of Malachi. There, the book of Malachi is amazing. It really, and there's some things about it that is really kind of like, wow, it's kind of ironic to the times we're living in as well. There, anyway, we'll get to it. But in Leviticus chapter, uh, chapter 27, now people say, you know, old tithing and all that, that was Old Testament. No, it wasn't. Ask Abraham who tithed the king Melchizedek. A tenth, Hebrews 7 said it was a tenth of his income, a tenth of his, of his wealth. That was before the law. That was before Moses ever showed up. And Abraham is the father of our faith, right? And Jesus came and hung on a tree that the blessings of who? Abraham. Not Moses, but the blessings of Abraham would come upon us. Abraham did this from the beginning. He tithed in the very beginning. You can't argue with Scripture. But in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, it says, And all the tithe of the land, all the, everybody say all the tithe. All the tithe of the land. That means all 10%. Not just 9% of the tithe or 5% of that or the 2% of the tithe, but all 10% of the tithe, the whole tithe, the whole 10%, right? Of the land, whether the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is whose? It is whose? So well, that's Leviticus. He is, yeah, and that's, this was a period under the law. He's, he was explaining to him, but it's still the Lord's today. It was the Lord's then. It's the Lord's now. Somebody, who's, who's got some money? Do you, who's got a $20 bill on him or something? I, I don't, my wallet's left in my, Steve's got nothing. Mine's in my office. You got something? Now, you want to give, let's say you want to give this to Q, right? You give this to me to give to Q. Would it be right for me to take this 20 that, now, cute, maybe he wants to give it to you. Hey, hey, payday for you, right? Y'all work it out? No, I'll give it back to you. Let's, Drew, I'll put Drew on the spot. Anyway, let's Drew wants to be a real blessing. You'll give it to Q. But the Q would say, no, that's right, brother. You be blessed. And we'll have a back and forth blessing fest. Anyway, but so if, if Drew wanted to give him this money and gave it to me to carry it to him, what if I just did this? Other than being really creepy, we're doing it, right? It's a weird way to put money in your pocket. I'm trying not to hit all the cuts on my hand. How about that? But if I were to slip it in my pocket, would that be right? 
No, why? It's not mine. It's, it's, it's stealing. You have to understand, he was very clear, the tithe is mine, says the Lord. He was saying, that belongs to me. You may have it in your hand. Drew may have given it to me. But it's still mine. And it had a purpose attached to it. This 20, it was his. And there's a purpose. And until it shows up over here, the ownership doesn't change until it goes into his hands. It's still Drew's right now. I'm just carrying it. I'm carrying it to to Q. But until that happens, it belongs. If I put it in my pocket, I am stealing from Drew. I'm not necessarily stealing from Q. Now, I'm hurting Q because something that should have been his never was his. Why? Because I chose to keep it. Why are so many people struggling is because they're stealing from God. If 2% or whatever people, what are the percent? There was not one of those percentages that was over 50% tithed. They were all really, if really, if you think about it, all of those numbers were really sad. For people who say that their faith is really important to them and they go to church at least twice a month, they really love the one who came and died for them, the one who shed his blood for them and purchased their freedom now and forever. They love them so much, they're going to steal from them. I love my wife, I don't steal from her. I love my parents. My parents were out of town this last week. They were in Cal- last week and a half. They were in California. I had keys to their house. Can I tell you? Pastor Greg didn't take a single thing. <laughs> Now, she didn't want me to take some, like, milk or, or orange juice or something. Well, I took that, but she told me to take it, right? But I didn't just go in and help myself. You know, my dad's got a gun in there, and I know the, the, the gun cabinet, and I know the code to that. I'm just going to, he's not here. I'm just going to go help myself. I love him. He's my dad. I love him so much. I'm going to help myself to his gun. No, that would be a terrible son, wouldn't I? Is that love? Yet people do this all the time when their tithes are concerned. And people say, well, Pastor Greg, we don't have time to really get into it, but I can't do it. I just can't do it. I just can't do it. Well, you're, first of all, you're saying the word of God's not true. You're say, and more specifically, to, to, believe, to really believe that is to believe God's a liar. But I'm here to tell you, he's not a man that he should lie. Or the son of man that he should repent. Has he said it? Will he not do it? Right? Has he promised? Will he not make it good? He is a man of his word. God is a God of his word. He will do what he says he will do. And that is irrespective of your circumstance, regardless of your situation, no matter what's going on, even what you've experienced in the past, what has he said? He said, the tithe belongs to me. Remember, he said, the tithe belongs to me. Remember what he told in the book of Haggai? Consider your ways. And just by you making this purpose to it, a real purpose to do it, a real heartfelt, now you have to walk it out, right? But you've changed your heart, you're going to do it. He said, I, from this day forward, he even named the day, I will bless you. I know a lot of people get upset about the tithe, but but... This is coming from the influence of this world system. It's where it's coming from, this world system. We'll look at Malachi another time, but, but the book of Malachi is amazing. And there's some things even there that I was I, kind of looking at. Steve and I this week were talking, I was like, you know, I was reading this and kind of looking at what does that actually mean? Like, wow, I need to expand my, my thinking a little bit. You know, people say, I'll tithe when my boat comes in. Or when my ship comes in. I'll tithe when my ship comes in. No, you won't. The reality is a ship can never come in if you never make room for a kayak to dock at your bank. Right? A ship's a big old vessel, isn't it? Captain Kirby's over there checking his math. What's that? Okay. (laughs) His wheels are spinning. You see, when my ship comes in, if you don't make room for that kayak to dock at your bank, the ship is never going to pull up. If you have a harbor that's, that, that only a small vessel can get in, if you try to park a cruiser or, a, or a, a, an aircraft carrier there, you're going to do a lot of damage to the shoreline. It'll never be able to dock, but you've got to make room for where you're at. 
There's so many testimonies. Maybe we'll do this another time. There's so many people who have testimonies of making a decision. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to put God at his word. I'm going I'm to do what the Bible says, no matter what it looks like, no matter what I was told. This is what the Bible says. This is what I'm going to do. I'm making a decision. I'm making a decision, and God said, from this moment forward, I'm going to bless you. The principle still applies. I'm going to do what God said. I'm going to put God's word first. I'm going to do what he said. you got to get to where you're getting taken care of so you can be a blessing, and it starts with being obedient with the tithes, putting first things first. We have so many testimonies of people who have done this, and God started blessing them. When they didn't even understand how, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they said, I can't explain it to you. Amy and I've been there. You put it, you write it down, and on paper, it makes no sense. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It makes zero sense. And when I mean sense, I don't mean pennies. I mean, it makes no sense at all and no sense. I mean, it makes, how is this working? My numbers haven't changed. What's coming in hasn't changed. But suddenly, I have, I have stuff left over. How is this happening? We've been called to live at a, at a standard in a way of life. And have things and experience things that is not common. We're supernatural people who serve a supernatural God. But you can't steal from them. You can't rob. And, and re- listen, before more so than just robbing God, I mean, you're, you're stealing from him. You're stealing from his opportunity to be the dad he wants to be in your life. People want to take care of their kids. People want to bless their kids. He wants to bless you. We'll look at some of these things at another time. Like I said, like I said all along, we're not trying to, to talk money out of anybody's pocket. We're, we're, we're wanting to help you. I'm wanting to help you. I believe it'll be a blessing to you. I wish we had more time to look at Malachi, but we don't. Man. Making simple adjustments. Making simple adjustments. You know, last Sunday night I talked about different reasons why people give, people for different things people do. You know, issues of the heart are so important in every area of your life. Even from today's message, I don't want you to leave and feel pressured. I have to do something. If you, if you are going to make a decision to tithe or give or whatever because you feel pressured, don't do it. Just don't. Well, what if that happens? What will happen to the church? God will take care of us. God will take because he's faithful. Our church is a giving church. Just, uh, uh, you know, I don't know the numbers, but what, uh, would you have an estimate of what, what's our church given to missions on a yearly basis? Over 100,000, easy. And that's what's coming here, but also out of the general fund, just the, our church is, is a generous church. We're having to reach all around the world. Do you think God's going to cut that off? No. If every person here decide I'm not going to do it anymore, God would, he, he'll send the ravens to start dropping some cash off in our parking lot if he needs to. He's not going to defund the gospel. We're a giving church, right? But if your heart's not right, if you're feeling pressure, don't do it. Get alone with the Lord. Get alone with him, not with your checkbook. Get alone with the Lord and his word. All right, Lord, what do I need to do? And until you can have the right heart about it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Remember in, in Proverbs, it says to honor the Lord with the first fruits of all your increase, right? You remember, remember the scripture, Proverbs, Proverbs 3, I guess, you know, honor the Lord with, your, with the first fruits of all your increase, honoring him. It's not honor when you're like twisted arm, got to drag it out of my wallet, grumbling the whole time. That's not honoring God. You have to make these adjustments. God wants to bless you. God needs you to want to be blessed. (laughs) Yeah, to get your needs met, but he wants to get so much to you. He wants to fund the God. He wants you to be the person he's called you to be, to be the blessing. He's wanting Abner Yoders to be raised up out of this church. I know we already have one that said, she she came after our church. She's, I'm going to be an Abner Yoder. Listen, you can, according to your faith, but faith requires action and diligence at the same time. You can stand with me. God wants to bless you. Everybody say that. Say, God wants to bless me. God wants me to prosper in all things and be in health, just as his soul prospers. He wants it. 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 
Like I said, I believe there are people here that God, there's a, there's a grace for you. There's an, I'm not, oh, now here to go, Pat, preachers talking about what's going to happen. They're trying to, no, I'm telling you, because of what the Bible says. And we'll look at it at some point. But according to what the Bible says, there, God wants to do so much. In, there are people here, if you'll just simply obey, just simply say, you know what, Lord, I'm not going to do it my way. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to be faithful. There will be a time of proving yourself. There will be a time of proving yourself. But I'm, all, I'm here to tell you, there's a time where God will prove himself as well. He'll declare from day number one, I will bless you. From day number one, you set your heart to do it and you begin to be faithful. He'll, he'll say, listen, I'm going to bless you. He's going to do it. You have to walk some things out. But I'm telling you, God will never fail you. Don't fail yourself. I believe God wants to raise up people in this church. I believe Impact Family Church can be a blessing. I, I'm looking for the day where Impact Family Church, we're funding multiple crusades. Not even the ones, not the ones we go to, but multiple crusades. For Christopher Allen, Keith Hershey, all the different, where we're funding things, even things in our own community, we're funding those things. We're funding things. We're, we're a place where God, His blessing is flowing through so much that we're, remember the scripture we read on Sunday mornings, that there's, there's, you have an abundance for what? Every good work. Is it good? Is it beneficial? Will it bless? Will it bring glory to Jesus? Well, then let's, let's be in a position as a church where we can just fund it all. I, I want that. I want us to be those people. You'll get to, your, your standard of, of, of living will increase. Just keep your heart at the right place. Look at what I've done. No, look what God has done. Amen. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word this morning. Father, we love you so very much. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to hear, even on subjects that others may not like. Lord, we choose to like your word. We choose to like your opinion. We choose to like how you see things. and, and to, We choose to favor your righteous cause and to favor your will and to put your word first. Father, thank you for the opportunity this morning to hear from the scriptures, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to hear your perspective and your will in the matter. Lord, I continue, myself, I continue to follow you in this area. Lord, and I know you're faithful. And Lord, every person here, maybe they've not been where they should be, not doing exactly what they should be doing according to your word. Father, I ask for grace for them. Lord, you reveal yourself to them. Father, help them see what needs to be done. Lord, I know you will never forsake them. You will never let them down, Father. You will always meet their every need. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy, Father. We thank you for your grace. Father, we are thankful that we are a blessed people. Hallelujah. We love you so much, Father. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God.